Hey, my name is Mike Donnelly, uh, as you just heard. Um, before I start, I'd like to just mention other people that have been involved in this project, which there are many, and especially uh, work from uh, York University looking at use of flints, and Cardiff is involved in other aspects of agroecology. I'd also really like to thank, and um, quite rare for the commercial venture, I'd like to thank the developers who were incredibly helpful throughout this project. Um, without their assistance, we would never have achieved what we did. And also, she mentioned that it's as we have evidence of council jobs, it's actually possibly easier to get decent funding from council work than it is from, from other uh, housing developments, but also historically and uh, um, massively with the funding. Um, so setting the scene a bit, uh, Bexley Hastings Link Road was at the new road which is designed to ease the congestion between the town of Bexley and Hastings, which are on the southeast coast of England. It's a five and a half kilometre stretch of road, only a single lane in each direction, so actually quite a small road, but it ran through an area of um, outstanding natural beauty, so it was, it was quite controversial, it went to public inquiries. Um, the road itself starts in an urban area, and there is very little um, prehistoric archaeology surviving, as you'd expect, but um, once it emerges from the back of uh, Bexhill, it runs through a series of valleys, which are these dark blue areas, and over a series of bridges. Um, and these, these systems, although there's no, there was no known archaeology in this area, no known prehistoric archaeology, archaeology before we began, obviously these are uh, infilled wetland areas have massive potential. Um, I should also say it floods every winter for quite a depth, so uh, working here is quite, quite tricky. Um, this shows you the kind of development of the river system that so was on Coombe Haven. Uh, around about, this only goes back to 10,000 days. It's broadly similar. It would have been inland, um, and probably on a scarp uh, astride the Sussex coastal plain. Um, but the river system itself is not very large. It only runs for about 20 miles in land. Um, and obviously, at the time, the late Meso uh, early Mesolithic in the Upper Paleolithic, it is effectively probably quite fairly treeless um, in an inland river valley. By the time you get into the Mesolithic and later it becomes a sea and then it becomes a peat bog. I um, should just say a bit because we've been talking earlier about places like um, uh, Barnton Fields and the concerns about um, roads coming through these uh, disturbing you know, areas of undisturbed flint work. That there's methods that we use on commercial ventures that aren't actually very useful for finding where it's started. And there's methods we can use, better methods that we should be using. And this involves sort of direction from the planning process so that they require us to do things like, for instance, to stop using evaluation trenches to the it Really, it's, 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 it's almost um, a waste of time. Whereas test kits put by hand are perfect for this scenario. And this is actually us attempting to dig an evaluation trench uh, into this wetland area. It works fine when you're looking for peat systems. It works fine when you're digging um, in the Bronze Age, I mean, bone archaeology, but it doesn't really work, as you can imagine, for flint scarp. Um, this is a couple of examples. Really. This first one here, the person who dug this trench has absolutely nailed it. They've got the levels as well as you can get them with a machine, 20 ton machine. But as you can see from the drawing, this action trench probably shifts a bit. You can see a clear line of truncation, which you can see the scar here also becomes less dense. It becomes less dense. So if, even if you dig it perfectly, and you're lucky enough that the underlying topography matches what you're trying to do, you're going to truncate the archaeology somewhat. And this is a bad example. <laughs> and unfortunately, this might be scattered 88, might be one of our uh, late glazing scatters, but very little bit survives. And you can see the trench is simply truncated away. Um, with this in mind, when we went to the actual main phases of excavation, we altered our strategy. The main, the main phase of excavation required more evaluation. And what we did is we basically, we augured some of large areas to give us a handle on the deposits. We altered the shape of some of these ponds so we wouldn't impact the, the preserved land surface. And when we actually, we also did handle testers to find these scars. And when we come to excavate it, again, this is quite appropriate for farming fields, we understrip massive areas intentionally. Understripping is a bad word in commercial archaeology. Um, it usually means you've done something wrong. But here, 
it's done in fashion so that you did not damage the print scars. And um, it, it worked very well. And just to say briefly about how we, we handled the, the metal flint and how we handled uh, excavating these, these scars. And the Guildford scar was done fairly similar methodology, but it used a quite complicated system that you often see in commercial ventures where every spit in the um, every spit on the uh, next square spit gets its own unique context number. And this can lead to thousands of context numbers and it's very prone to um, number number errors. And we went for a very simple system. We gave scatters an individual number and we gave the grids, they were always five by five grids, we gave them the code and we labeled the individual squares A to Y and we just recorded the spit number. And with this system we managed to take you know, we recover around a thousand three D fines and excavate to them body plant scatters with very few uh, numbering errors. Um, and if for instance a farm entails if it's going to go ahead and going to take large scale plant scatters, I would recommend that system. Um, so in terms of la laser activity, this is really getting a bit nervous. Um, we don't actually work very much. And the reason for that might well be that uh, the river system in question is so small that it wasn't, wasn't really a suitable river which to penetrate inland into Britain. Or it may just be that this is actually a fairly standard representation of how much lake glacial activity there is. I should say that we probably uncovered around about a five kilometre strip by about 50 metres of preserved and land surface. So it wasn't you know, little snapshots into the, the landscape, it was quite extensive. Um, and this is one area, a main area of activity. We have a very odd piece which we usually call the Cornish Parsley Flint, which I don't have a picture of, but I brought it with me, so I, I like anyone has an opinion to offer on it. I think Nick suggested that once it is a, a core preform, and it is a very unusual flint and potentially lake lazy over there. There's one bruised blade, there's a spray find from in here, and there's a huge area of mesolithic activity, but there was one potential lay upper pallet that scattered 22, which I'll talk about now. Um, so this was found really kind of by accident. Um, we dug these uh, drainage ditches effectively. We started off looking for archaeology, then we cut into a ditch. There was a, um, a bronze age field system with a ditch, and at the side of it, I think you can see these pretty massive chunks of flint, which when you're digging up the late Mesolithic and early Mesolithic effects, so flints of this size are actually extremely rare. Um, it was found kind of by accident that the developer again we persuaded them that these things are important and they actually let us expand the area to try and fully excavate flint stuff. Um, the one area we didn't get to dig is on the right, which was under the, the hall road. So this is where all the plant access and all the materials on the site were brought in out, and we never got the hall road moved, so there is still some of this flint scar to work. Um, like many of the scatters, the Bechtel involves overlapping flint scatters, and there's definitely a late Mesolithic scatter which overlaps with it, which is unfortunate and, and makes um, trying to interpret this a bit more difficult. And there's possibly even another little late Mesolithic cluster. Um, so, in terms of the flints, so th th these are some of the blades from um, Scatter 22. They're not excessively large, they get over 10 centimetres, but most of them in the 8 to 10 centimetre range. They're actually very thick and heavy blades for, for Bexel, and they utilise this really quite beautiful flint with these almost calcite and bands from the film, which is, is not seen at Bexel or any other shot, apart from two or three straight lines. Um, at the time, we did have a site visit, various people came to, to see this, see these scatters as they were being excavated, and there's a suggestion this could be a English channel flint. So, anyone who's worked on that material would be quite interesting to hear their opinions. It's mostly hard and struck and it's mostly plain, quite big platforms, but there's occasional passive platforms and you can see crest in here. And these all these all be fit these pieces. Um, in terms of tools, the I guess most of the really obvious tools are quite heavy bureaus on truncations and tight neutral bureaus on large slates. Um, but unfortunately, there are no um, toilets whatsoever. Um, there are lots of bark clays, bark pieces. Um, almost all are made in the same flint, so I'm assuming they're all made of the same core, and I think we have this core. Um, the cores tend to have core tablet 
a very stressed and even repressed in um, Unfortunately, a bit like the, uh, the guest at Guildford, we found quite a few, but we found 3,000 clips from here, but it was only, you know, there were no, no points whatsoever. Um, So actually, we don't really know how old it is, but our feeling is it might be kind of nicer. Um, our, we should say that we're only at the initial stage of assessment, so uh, more analysis should follow. But we, I mean, there's no way we'll get any video carbon dates on the site. There's no CPR, um, unfortunately. So maybe it'll get TL dates, but there's very little carbon. Um, this is another part of the project. This is the main part of the project. And again, you can see this absolute mass of flint scatters everywhere. Insanely dense concentrations of mesolithic flint work. Um, occasional stray finds, such as there's one bruised blade and a bruised flake from here. And there's a set of quite large blades that refit with a couple of place in the flint scatters. But, um, and there's one long blade site, I believe, in here that scatters 75, and a few long blades on this area of the island, which are mostly LA and make mesolithic flint work. Um, so these are some of the, the pieces. There's some pieces of quite heavy bruising and then slightly lighter bruising. And that was the stray find, and this is from site 15. But these are from scatter 75, and you can see this is about 15 centimeters long, a bit cresting, and it's, it's actually not complete, it's broken. This is obviously snapped as well. But these are very, very long straight blades, and there are quite a few of these from the scatter. But the scatter itself is not large. It only has about 700 points. Um, and this again just shows you the scatter 75 is quite unfortunate for a scatter at Bex Hill and it's cut by a modern ditch, cut in half by a modern ditch, and it has several features associated with the bird man. And this scatter is quite a very mesolithic looking point, but given the fact that my kids were found as serious what well, it's possible that these are complementary scatters. And the one I for from in 75 was one of these very unpointy, obliquely blooded uh, micros. So potentially with my kids associated here. Um, in total though, if we add up all the um, proper paleolithic finds from Bexel, it only adds up to about 0.8%. Even if the set start at 22 is up to paleolithic, the upper pali and the terminal upper pali only add up to 0.8%. And to put it in context, the early mesolithic scars add up to 10 times that amount and the early mesolithic over 100 times that amount. So it does suggest that there's very limited movement into this valley system that did become, I think, very important in the early Mesolithic and through into the late Mesolithic. Um, I am going to say a bit about the early Mesolithic as well, simply because this is largely um, what we found, and I think it's important to set, set everything into correct context. There is a lot of early Mesolithic activity in this valley. Um, these are three sites quite close together. This is on a spur overlooking the valley. This is all what would have been to be a false um, shoulder and a false crest here. And this is on the main, if you like, vantage point where we're looking in the valley. And here, by the early Mesolithic, we're getting to potentially tents or um, hides or hunting, hunting camps where this almost entirely had microbes as its tools. Whereas just across the way, about 150 meters, maybe 200 meters, there's lots of scatters at the same elevation. Giving us exactly similar video carbon dates that focused on scraper production and on viewings. So the, the landscape is clearly being used in a complicated fashion by the late by the early Mesolithic, but hasn't really any evidence of very dense activity in the upper part. Um, that's just some of the early Mesolithic microbes. And I should say as well as with Bexhill is that as, as we actually got at the end, we were basically given two years to excavate it. This is the last site we were working on, and this is what the understripping means that we can actually work the site without damaging it quite well. But it didn't really matter what we did with pumps and how to try to control the water. Eventually, the whole valley flooded, and we left a lot of the archaeology unfinished, including the scattered chemistry. Um, I'm not even going to be debating the Mesolithic site, it's not really appropriate for this conference. But just to say, there was pretty remarkable success dating Mesolithic activity, including early Mesolithic and, and, and also the Horsham phase here. Um, but we didn't have any luck trying to date any of our um, uh, upper power scars. Um, and I believe that. Thank you.